Thank you, Martina. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to tell you about, how to rule, rule out cold dark matter. Uh, and, uh, or, uh, or, or either we would rule out cold dark matter or all the viable dark matter models. So let me just give you a brief review of uh, how we got to where we are today. When the idea that the dark matter might be non-baryonic was proposed, late 70s, early 1980s, it was immediately realized that uh, regardless of the details of the particles and the masses, it could be classified into three distinct families, hot, warm, and cold. And the names just come from the effects of uh, thermal motions in the power spectrum that comes out of inflation. So here's the power spectrum from inflation. That's a uh, density power spectrum as a function of the frequency k. Large scale, small scale is here. Inflation predicts uh, a power law with an approximately equal to one. And then, depending on what uh, the property, the thermal properties of these particles, then the power spectrum evolves. For example, if the dark matter is, is a hot particle, like a neutrino with a mass of a few tens of electron volts, then these particles are relativistic when they decouple, so they free stream out of small fluctuations that the power spectrum requires a cutoff on a scale. Uh, characteristic of galaxy clusters. If the dark matter is cold, then these particles don't free stream. Uh, there is no cold, well, there is a cutoff, but it's way down in the center of Stockholm at the, air, uh, at the scale of an Earth's mass. For practical purposes, there isn't a cutoff. There's a suppression in the growth, something called the Lazarus effect, but there is no cutoff. And if the dark matter is in between hot and cold, warm, then for an appropriate mass, and actually, the cutoff uh, scale here scales inversely with the mass of the particle. So if the uh, uh, warm particle has a mass of a few keV, then the cutoff would occur on the scale of uh, dwarf galaxies. So that's the picture that emerged from the 1980s. And um, it was then soon realized that uh, to see what the implications of these power spectra are, this is in, in the linear regime, then we need to uh, figure out how they grow. And it turns out not the only way, but a particularly useful way to uh, see what the uh, evolution of these power spectra is, is using computer simulations. So uh, for those of you who don't uh, follow computer simulations, they're quite simple things. Uh, you start off with initial conditions, which we didn't know in the 80s, but now we know, because we see them in the uh, uh, temperature and isotropies of the microwave micron. Uh, but uh, they assume some initial conditions. You make an assumption about the concept of the universe. The key one is the nature of the dark matter, and then you just uh, program the key equations in a computer, which you then solve and see what kind of universe you get. So that program uh, was uh, started in 1983, uh, and these are uh, the first simulations. Actually, these are not the first simulations of so dark matter. is the second. The first simulations were done behind the Iron Curtain by Clinton and Shandari. But it was difficult to talk to these guys in those days, 1980s. So this was the first in the West of what the universe would look like if the dark matter was a hot particle, a neutrino with a mass of a few electron volts, the tens of electron volts. It was actually an experiment, a rumor that filtered through the Iron Curtain that uh, a Russian experimentalist, Lubimov, had actually measured a, a neutrino mass of 30 electron volts. And this is what the universe would look like, nothing like the universe as we knew it in the 1980s. So uh, one of the first results of this program was to conclude that uh, the neutrino could not have a mass of, uh, well, Lubimo had to be wrong, the neutrino could have a mass of that size, uh, because in that case, the universe would contain these very large structures, which just reflect the cutoff in the power spectrum that don't have any parallel in the real universe. And now we know that is indeed the case. But then it became clear then that what we now call lambda CDM these really are the first lambda CDM simulations. Uh, don't ask me why we were interested in lambda in 1985. Uh, I can tell you the pub, but uh, uh, it just happens that we chanced upon more or less the right parameters. And it's clear here that uh, this gave a much better match to the galaxy clustering uh, as we knew it at the time. And the intervening 30 years have uh, a lot of effort has been put into developing uh, this model and testing it empirically. Uh, and now we have uh, uh, these amazing results from Planck, the power spectrum of the uh, temperature and isotropies on the sky. Uh, this is lambda CDM, and uh, you all know this clock very, very well. And equally, uh, the, the interest started really with clustering, soon overtaken by the microwave background, but uh, 
Also, the clustering pattern is equally uh, very convincing as uh, well what comes out of the simulations here compared to what we actually see in the universe. So here's a um, uh, summary of 30 years of uh, research in <coughs> one plot. Here's the power spectrum that I showed before, large scale, small scales. Here's lambda CDM is a black line. Here are the measurements of the temperature and isotropies in the microbiome radiation extrapolated to region zero using linear theory, so we can compare them with, uh, directly with measurements of galaxy clustering. It's pretty impressive. It's two orders of magnitude, or more two and a half orders of magnitude in scale. Uh, nearly, uh, um, the fact, uh, 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 that's two and a half orders of magnitude in scale. So it's pretty good uh, agreement between the predictions which precede many of these observations uh, and the data. However, in reality, this agreement, impressive as it is, tells us nothing about lambda, no idea what lambda is, and it doesn't even tell us that CDM is what the time matter is, because, for example, if CDM was a one particle, say, a sterile neutrino, I'll tell you more about those in a minute, then the cutoff would occur here on the scale of dwarf galaxies that are not probed by any of these data. So the universe could be made of one dark matter and all the agreements of CDM would transfer <coughs> directly. So the um, question, uh, so, so both CDM <coughs> and one dark matter are entirely compatible with everything we know about large scale structure. We heard yesterday from Matt some constraints from the mass of one dark matter particles from the Barbanafa forest. He did a very good job of that, so I'm going to repeat that today. Uh, but uh, uh, it's still the case that even with constraints on the particle, on that particle mass, one can find parts parameter space where both these uh, completely different assumptions about the nature of the dark matter are entirely compatible with everything we know from large scale structure. And as many of you will know, there are claims that both types of dark matter have been discovered. Uh, cold dark matter from the gamma ray excess from the galactic center, interpreted uh, by some people as a uh, an excess produced by an annihilation of uh, cold dark matter. Uh, I think the excess is there, for sure, but the interpretation is extremely controversial. And that also claims that warm dark matter, for example, a sterile neutrino, has been discovered, in this case, not through annihilation radiation, but <coughs> uh, through the uh, measure 3.5 kV line in the X-rays coming from galaxies and clusters, which if it really was the case of uh, that matter would be perfectly compatible with the sterile neutrino of mass twice that, 7 keV. So these are very, very controversial. They're alternative explanations. Uh, and uh, I, in my opinion, it's very unlikely that both of these are right. Can't imagine the universe has comparable amounts of both. Some of you might think it's very unlikely that either of them is right. But I think we need to take them seriously. These are the experimental data that we have. <laughs> So, <coughs> the, um, and, and, the, and the relevant scales where we can distinguish them are the scales for the universe, which is dwarf galaxies and below. So just a word about stellar neutrinos. They may not be as familiar as uh, WIMPs, many of you. Stellar neutrinos have a good motivation for particle physics because they explain all sorts of other things in addition to dark matter, like for example, why neutrinos have a mass. They also can explain biogenesis. Uh, there is a, a stellar minimum, a stellar neutrino minimum standard model by Bojarski, Shaposnikov, and colleagues. Uh, there are three stellar neutrinos, two of GV mass, which is the ones that solve these important problems in particle physics, and the other one of KV mass, which is kind of uh, uh, tuned to be the dark matter. But it's a perfectly respectable uh, uh, motivation from particle physics. Now, unfortunately, it's more complicated, uh, warm dark matter or stellar neutrinos. Uh, uh, CDM, because CDM essentially has no free parameters, so uh, the theory is perfectly well specified, whereas in the case of uh, stellar neutrinos, there are two parameters. One is the mass of the particle, and I'm going to assume that uh, it's 7 keV, just to simplify this discussion, uh, uh, because that's what we think, uh, what the people claim to have measured. Uh, and then, even then, there's another parameter called L6, which has to do with uh, binary asymmetry, with biogenesis. But the interesting thing is that uh, the spectra are confined in some region here. So if we could rule out the coldest, similar, most similar to CDM, then we would rule them all out. So that's the philosophy. So let me show you what the universe would look like, in fact, what the halo of the Milky Way would look like if the universe is made of cold dark matter here on the left. 
uh, and uh, here's an evolution of the dark matter that's going to end up in a halo. So if I stop it here, reach it 10 or so, you see that uh, there is a lot of structure already beginning to form in the CDN universe because the power spectrum has power and all scales. There's nothing in the warm dark matter case because uh, there is no power on those small scales. And then eventually, if I reach it 8 or so, the first structure beginning to form in the warm dark matter universe, phases of the simulation are the same. So this object is that one, that one is that one. And on large scales, or scales of big galaxies, they're identical. But on scales smaller than that, you can see that there are very large differences between them. And uh, you can see them even better here. And uh, on the left is the, uh, what the halo of the Milky Way would look like if the, we live in a CDM universe. This is what it would look like if we live in a warm dark matter universe. So when you look at this, I know I don't think there are any observational astronomers. Well, and Catherine is an observational astronomer. So you'd think it's shocking that uh, observers spend billions of um, euros or uh, pounds or dollars. Well, pounds won't get you very far, but dollars, euros. <laughs> they cannot tell us whether we live in a place like this or like that. It's shocking. Um, actually, you see it's not that they're inept. You see that it's actually very, very hard. Uh, uh, by the normal techniques one would imagine using to distinguish between them. So the first thing you think is, well, we know the galaxies have satellites. Uh, 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 are, uh, so the obvious test would be just to count how many satellites there are. So here is a nice return from James Bullock that shows some of the satellites. Uh, you may know some of them, the LMC, the SMC, called the Fornax, and so on. Now the Milky Way has about 50 satellites, many satellites discovered to date. So, let's count. Uh, well, uh, here there's no points, hundreds of thousands. Count here, right? Count one, two, three, four, five, it's about 50. Right? This is job done. Uh, we know now that dark matter is a stellar neutrino with a mass of 7 keV. Well, that would be rather naive. This argument is entirely wrong, and it's been known to be wrong for decades by many people, and uh, the reason, but not by everyone, is because most of these most of chaos never are ever able to make a galaxy because of very simple physics, the basis of galaxy formation, namely that um, we know the universe was reionized, we heard all about it yesterday, reionization hits hydrogen to about 10 to 4 Kelvin, and then if the gas is uh, at that uh, adiabat, then it, it just no way it can cool into halos whose effective temperature is uh, less than that. The gas is just too much entropy, never cool. So most of these halos never see a byron in their life because the uh, byrons are just too hot. And uh, for slightly larger halos where a few stars form, all it takes is one supernova to get much more energy than the binding energy of the gas in the small halo, it blows it all out, and that also prevents galaxy formation in slightly larger halos. So it's really simple physics known for a long time, worked out in detail. It's so simple that you can do this analytically by Andrew Benson in his thesis uh, 15 years ago. Here are the results of modeling these processes. Here is the expected luminosity function of satellites, nominous function of luminosity. These are faint, those are bright. And uh, these are Andrew's predictions. Here we'll all scatter here uh, at the bright end. And these were the observations in red, as were known uh, way back then in 2002. And Andrew made a very important prediction that there should be a population of faint satellites. It wasn't known at the time, uh, but that was duly discovered a few years later in the Sloan Institute Sky Survey. Now, does that mean that um, CDA is the right answer? No, uh, but it does mean that if it is the right answer, then uh, we understand the basics of galaxy formation. Now, so now we can do the same kind of calculations in a, in a more general way using hydro simulations. There are several breakthroughs in this subject in the last few years. Uh, Rupert's done some uh, and uh, part of the Virgo Consortium. Uh, but as part of the Virgo Consortium, we've done something called the Eagle Project, which is now to simulate cosmological volumes where not as I've done most of my life, you just focus on the dark matter, but we can actually now follow the variants in great gory detail. And um, the, uh, some amazing things come out of these uh, uh, simulations, but one that is particularly important is that the Eagle uh, simulation is capable of reproducing what I would think is the most basic statistic of the galaxy population, just the number of galaxies, a function of mass, instead of mass function, plotted here, so this is number as a function of mass, 
uh, faint or small, large yet, and that the data are very well reproduced by the EGO simulation. So this to me is sort of the uh, benchmark by which one should judge the success of these sort of simulations. Now as part of EGLE, we have um, uh, simulated, uh, in order to try to understand more about dark matter, uh, we've simulated uh, a, a, a series of uh, local group analogs as part of something called the Apostles Project. The name was given by me, uh, was given by Til Zavala. It stands for a project of simulating the local environment. Uh, and here is what the Milky Way with the local group would look like if we were lucky enough to be able to see the dark body. It looked really exciting, really interesting, with four lots of interesting structure. So that's what it would look like if we could see the dark body. Unfortunately, we can't, and we can only see the light. And it looks a lot more boring for the physics that I just explained. So here, only the big ones, for example, that one, that one, that one, uh, they, make, uh, uh, they make galaxies. But most of these little long objects never make a galaxy, and the physics is exactly the same. And this is why it's so hard for observational astronomers to be able to tell us the difference between living in a CDM or in a world dark body universe, because that's what they see, but that's what they really, that's what we really would like to see, and I'm going to show you later when we can actually see that. Now, so here it is quantitatively. I, I, let's look at the Milky Way. Number as function of mass, again. Uh, many, many, many dark matter halos, but uh, very few uh, galaxies. Here is the data for the Milky Way, the satellite velocity function. Here are the range of possibilities uh, in different realizations of these simulations. And it works for the Milky Way, it works for M31, and even works for dwarfs in the local volume. Uh, and uh, so that's not just exclusive of Eagle. Uh, there's another famous project called Illustris. Uh, with a code uh, called a REPO, <coughs> and um, we've now uh, teamed up with them to do a series of simulations of Milky Way like Alex, a project called Origa. These are kind of things that you can now uh, do in simulations, but uh, here is an equivalent plot from a very nice paper by Christine Simpson uh, on Astro PH a few weeks ago. And here again, uh, it's exactly the same result as we had with Apostle, with a completely independent code, independent um, prescriptions for the physics. Now this plot uh, uh, is uh, one that um, is complicated but this is one line. I just want to make one point. Here is a uh, fraction of dark matter halo. The halos that are dark, its fraction is here. It's 100%. <laughs> the only point I want to make is that according to the simulations, all objects with a mass less than about 5 times to the 8 solar masses are dark, 100% are dark. Then this will drop very rapidly and above 10 to the 10 all objects have a galaxy. So uh, below 5 times 10 to the 8 or so, uh, then uh, all objects are dark. So all the halos are dark, and uh, astronomers will never see them. So we wait till the end, otherwise I, I, just won't the end. I won't tell you how to rule it out. Does, does your simulation account for tidal stripping? of the Everything, 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 of course. So what so fraction of the dark matter is in the substructure as opposed to? Uh, it's about 40% of the resolution of the simulation. As the integral number. Yeah. Thanks. OK. Now, so how about warm dark matter? Now, a warm dark matter may have a satellite problem, but for the opposite reason, because as I told you before, the uh, cutoff of the wavelength scales inversely to the mass of the particle. If the mass is very small, the cutoff is very large, and you wipe out all the small scale structures. So for example, these are thermal uh, warm dark matter particles, but if the mass is very small, they use no, no lumps, so no satellites would form. That most clearly is unrealistic, but as the mass goes up, then you get more and more of these lumps. Uh, and so you can rule out some of these very easily just because they don't make it's the opposite of this supposed satellite problem. They don't have enough clumps to make even 50 satellites. And I don't want to go into the details, uh, just to point out in one of the details, it's a paper by my former student, my global, uh, where we can actually rule out parts of parameter space from the stellar neutrino, but there's plenty of parameter space for the stellar neutrino where uh, the agreement with the satellites is perfectly fine. <clears throat> now, so, uh, when minor effects are taken into account, summarizing what I've told you so far, the absurd abundance of satellites compatible, totally compatible with CDN, uh, but rules out some warm dark matter models. So there's no such thing as a satellite problem in CDN. So I wish people would stop talking about that. Making up particle physics models to solve the satellite problem. There isn't a satellite problem. Us, 
humble and uh, well, maybe not humble, but modest <laughs> astronomers. We've known about these for 20 years. So please, particle physics, just stop talking about the satellite problem. There isn't a problem uh, of satellites. It's just galaxy formation physics and not fancy physics. Reionization, stellar evolution, very, very simple. So yes, and uh, go on, Catherine. But can I get into your time, Martina? Yeah? <laughs> I, like, I agree there isn't a satellite problem, but I think you're glossing over a lot of the uncertainties in how those baryon effects are. Like, we don't know really what the baryon effects are. We don't. You know, you know all of those love, it's this all gas and I think you're glossing over. Oh, of course, but the, I only have half an hour. The missiles you tweak to make those baryon simulations match your observations. Listen, uh, the only thing we tweaked in, in EVO was the large-scale the large scale stellar, uh, to get the, 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 uh, the velocity function on large-scale. That's so all we tweaked. And I've shown you three different calculations. Benson, uh, Zavala, and Origa all give you the same answer. So your star formation was all first principles calculation. No, no, no. Oh, well, I'm no. sorry. I thought there was no tweaking. No. <laughs> Michael. Ma so I, I'm getting lots of feedback. Thank you. Michael, <laughs> did the universe be ionized? Yes or no? No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but talking. we don't know how it reionized. <laughs> he's, he's been spending too much time in watching. Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't know how it reionized, but all, all he needs, Michael, all he needs to praise the Catherine made her point. Go on. Uh, okay. Right. okay, so uh, so we can distinguish uh, CDM from more that matter by counting satellites. We can. Uh, By the way, there's a print of that in the Tilsco Museum here if you want to see it. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, there's several of these in just around the water in Oslo. Anyway, so, the, uh, so there is no need to despair. Now I'm going to tell you how you can distinguish these two. Okay? So that's what I've been getting up in the last 30 years of my life. How do we distinguish? I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, ignore that. So how can we distinguish CDM from more dark matter? Well, as the uh, Till's pictures show you, we've been doing the wrong thing. Instead of looking at what you can see, you should be looking at what you cannot see, at the invisible subhalo, because that is where the difference are striving. Now, so for reference, here's a plot of the mass function again, uh, as function of mass, number as function of mass, for CDM, very, very large numbers. Here, the simulation comes out of resolution, it continues going. But in the case of warm dark matter, it, it peels off. And at about uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses, uh, about 3 times 10 to the 9 solar masses, uh, 3 times fewer halos in a 7 kb 7 neutrino model, and at 10 to the 8 it just plummets, and there's a factor of 10 fewer. So the differences are big, but then in the regime, when all halos are dark. However, we know how to look in the dark. Uh, into the dark. In fact, it's not just one, but two techniques. One I don't have time to tell you about. It's to do with gaps in stellar streams. And uh, just very briefly, what happens is that when a galaxy uh, is accreted by another galaxy satellite, like Sagittarius, they get tidally stripped, they produce these tides, tidal dark arms. And then if a small 10 to the 7 solar mass of halo comes shooting past one of these, it, it makes a gap. And that, in principle, it's complicated, but it's claimed you can, uh, in fact, measure the subhalo mass function in the Milky Way by looking, for example, at the tidal streams of Palma 5. But this is complicated, I don't have time to tell you about that, but I will tell you about gravitational lensing, because this is, I think, where the answer lies. And uh, this is um, a particular form of gravitational lensing, uh, uh, and uh, in the uh, case where here we have a lens, a massive galaxy, uh, maybe in a cluster, and uh, here's the source. <coughs> and in the case where the source, the lens, and the observer are perfectly lined up, we get this uh, uh, deflection of light, of course, but we get a, uh, uh, one of the most dramatic effects that nature has been able to produce, which is this Einstein ring. So in the case of perfect alignment, you get a perfect Einstein ring. Here's one, here's another one. If the alignment is slightly imperfect, then you get fragments of uh, Einstein rings called giant arcs. Now, here is the key thing. When the light from the source propagates, it gets a lens, not just by the main lens, but also by any structures that, that lie along the path. Substructures or structures that lie along the path of the light. So they do lens, they have mass, they lens. And what they do is that they produce distortions in the Einstein ring. 
Uh, and that's an idea that goes back to Simone Getty and Dion Fuchman who many years ago, they pioneered all this area. And the point is that um, in uh, the science that bring there are distortions, you cannot see them by eye, but there are distortions that you can extract from the data that reflect this additional lensing due to intervening small halos. And uh, uh, Simona uh, and Leon uh, have already claimed the detection of the substructure of 10 to the 8 solar masses, which is already the interesting regime. But they claim they can detect sub halos as small as 10 to the 7 solar masses. And that would clinch everything uh, that I've been telling you about so far. Now, because if one black matter is right, of course, the power spectrum is cut off. You should see zero 10 to the 7 solar mass halos. Zero. If you see one, you rule out stellar neutrinos. And if CDM is right, well, you should see hundreds of thousands uh, of these small sub halos. So the test is absolutely clean, unambiguous, no ifs and buts. This is it. Now, so uh, uh, more or less, uh, going back to what Kathleen and Michael were worrying about. And, uh, but in part, there are two important considerations to bear in mind. One is that the central galaxy can destroy some halos. As they pass by, they get totally disrupted. So you suppose Simona comes back and says, look, I have found no 10 to the 7 solar mass halos. CDM is ruled out. It turns out into the galaxy to destroy them. As we'll see in a minute, it doesn't really matter for a very subtle, but not subtle, but a very nice, elegant reason, which has to do with who dominates the signal, so halos in the lens, or uh, projected or field halos projected along the line of sight. So I'm going to tell you the answer to the two of them. Uh, there is a paper by Til Zavala again, uh, and also by my student uh, Jack Richings, who's coming out soon, addressing this problem. So the first one, uh, here's the answer to how much damage does the galaxy do to the subhalos. So here is uh, one of the apostle simulations of seen in dark matter. Here is at the scene in, uh, in, in Barrios. Maybe the people in the front row can see that the galaxy has eaten up quite a few of the subhalos, sub but only in the center. And uh, here it is quantitatively, you can look it up in this paper. So essentially, in the region of the Einstein ring, uh, about 40% uh, of the halos are actually destroyed by tidal effects, by interaction with the galaxy, fewer further out. It turns out it doesn't really matter. This does depend in the model, on the, on the high growth, but actually it's irrelevant. Because uh, it turns out, and this is a great simplification, that what dominates the signal is not the subhalos in the halo of the, of the lens, but the intervening halos along the line of sight. And uh, we worked this out with Randy in Beijing. Here is the signal, uh, lensing signal, function of mass, and the projected line of sight independent central, as we call them, or field halos, dominate by a factor of 10 over the number of subhalos. So we don't even need to know what the galaxy did. It's only 10%, the 10% effect and similar in one dark matter. So this really is a uh, extremely uh, elegant test because it depends only on, it's the cleanest possible you could imagine, it depends from a theoretical point of view only on the small mass end of the field halo mass function, which we know how to calculate. Any of you can calculate it, download gadget, run it, and you get the theoretical expectation. Uh, and the objects that are involved they have nothing to do with baryons. They've never seen a baryon in their life. They're 10 to the 7 solar mass halos. They've never been past a baryon. So there's no baryon effects to worry about. So how do you do that test? In my last minute, Martina, uh, well, so here are some theorist uh, uh, predictions. But you have to bear in mind that we're theorists. Simona was on this paper and took her name off, saying so you're too naive. But nevertheless, I'll tell you what the naive answer is. So if we had, as Simona says, a detection limit of 10 to the 7 solar mass uh, says for the subhalos, and we had 100 uh, lenses, here's what you would get. So what's plotted here on the y-axis doesn't really matter. Which, but which Simona? The Getty. The Getty. The one Simona. The Jedi. The Getty. How do you call it? The Jedi. The Jedi. Just like there's only one little, one Leo, Leo Messi, no, no, there's only no, one no. Simona. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, so, so it doesn't matter what's here on the y axis. Uh, this is just the projected halo number density of uh, things inside the Einstein ring, doesn't really matter. Here's the key axis, which is that cutoff uh, wavelength, uh, cutoff uh, length that I mentioned before. 
uh, pH for a, the coldest MK instead of neutrino is 1.3 times 10 to the 8 <coughs> solar mass. That's what the power spectrum in the world of the universe uh, peels off. So let's suppose we have 100 lenses and the universe is made of warm dark matter. Then this is what we would get. We would be able to constrain this cutoff to uh, be somewhere between a few times 10 to the 7, a few times 10 to the 9, and 3 sigma. CDM has no cover. So if you find this, if the universe is made of warm dark matter, it will rule out CDM at many, many, many sigma. No ifs and buts. It's ruled out. Likewise, if the universe is made of CDM, then here are the constraints with 100 uh, idealized uh, uh, um, uh, observations. Here's what you would find, 3 sigma. Uh, you would say, well, the cutoff has to be below a few times 10 to the 6. You rule out all stellar neutrino models. So that is the answer. So I encourage all of you to stop thinking of a satellite problem, drop everything you're doing, work on lensing, because this is it. Uh, we, uh, while the experimental particle physicists uh, try to find the particle, which ultimately is what we'd like to do, here's a way to at least focus attention on whether CDN is a likely particle or one that matter. So just uh, to comment on that for Meliaska's question, that you said that that would completely rule out all the neutrino models, but only those where the spectrum is thermal, right? Ah, no, no, sorry, sorry, I went through too fast through that. So the uh, so the ones that I uh, let, let me let me can I answer this question uh, in, in question time? So let me just conclude and then I'll answer your question. So so lambda CDM is a great success on scales greater than one megaparsec. Uh, uh, evidenced by the CME, like the structure galaxy evolution, but on those scales, lambda CDM is indistinguishable from one dark matter, for example, or uh, uh, self-interacting dark matter, or many other things like that. Uh, the identity of the dark I just focus on one dark matter, it's only like half an hour, but the same remarks uh, sort of go through for other models, and that, that are cut off. Uh, the identity of the dark matter makes a big difference on small scales, and I show you how counting thing galaxies not going to take you anywhere. Uh, halos are less than about 5 times 10 to the 8 are dark. They are the ones we need to focus on, particularly 10 to the 7 or so. Uh, and distortions of strong gravitational lensing offers a very clean test of these possibilities uh, and can potentially rule out CDM. Finally, I've been trying to do this since I was supposed to. Now maybe we can do it. And I'll stop here. <laughs>